Good morning, friends. <coughs> Welcome uh, to the live lecture series uh, from CEC, and uh, uh, we are running a series of lectures on uh, world literature, uh, the concept of which has been explained uh, many times over in the in the last lectures. And uh, today's lecture uh, would be on uh, Maria Campbell, a fiction ri uh, writer from Canada, and uh, we have the expert Dr. Richa Bajaj, uh, who teaches English literature. In Hindu College, Delhi University. Dr. Richa Bajaj has uh, published papers in international journals and uh, also published a number of books. And uh, she will be today analyzing before us, uh, telling us about her impressions of the fiction that shaped, got shaped in uh, Canada in the in the uh, last century. And uh, before I request Dr. Richa Bajaj to uh, speak, uh, I would uh, uh, tell you viewers that. We have the last 10 minutes of this lecture, uh, which is uh, 9.50 uh, for uh, discussion. Uh, if you have any questions, if you have any observations to share with us, if you have to raise certain issue, then you are free to do so uh, using the uh, call-free uh, number, which is 1-800-110-430. I repeat, the call-free uh, call number is 1-800-110-430. So now I request Dr. Jabajaz, welcome and uh, please give your lecture. Yes, thank you Dr. Anprakash. Uh, uh, today viewers, we will be discussing um, Canadian fiction and uh, within this, uh, um, you know, uh, this kind of a domain, I will pick up, uh, you know, just one writer today and um, her name is Maria Campbell and talk about her memoir or her um, autobiography as it is called Half Breed. So, uh, in order to understand uh, this uh, Canadian writer, she is a Canadian writer, but then at the same time, she is actually a writer, uh, you know, who is uh, called the Métis writer. Now, we need to understand before we actually to start discussing her work, uh, we need to understand what is this culture in Canada that we are discussing. I am talking about the Aborigines or the indigenous people who um, have, uh, you know, who, who have a kind of a mixed blood, so to speak. Now, uh, talking about um, that particular aspect, uh, you know, uh, let me speak to you about this culture or this region uh, that we understand. What is, where is Canada, and you know, what is what is the kind of culture that it has? Now, uh, we need to uh, remember that uh, in the, you know in this regard uh, we need to remember that uh, the you know the kind of explorers who came to the side of uh, the globe whether it was the united states of america or uh, you know the or canada uh, you know there was ex explorations of these different places started uh, you know obviously from christopher columbus onwards that process goes on from 1492 onwards but in the 17th century particularly you see an exodus of sorts from europe from from uh, England and people migrate to this side of the globe. So, they a lot of people go towards the United States and start living there and that is in a way the, the first settlers in United States and similarly in Canada also people from the European region came in to settle in Canada. Now, uh, the point is that there were different provinces in Canada where they came and settled. Now, when they came and this exercise, uh, you know, particularly began in the 17th century and uh, the place uh, Saskatchewan, which is uh, spoken of by uh, Maria Campbell in her uh, autobiography is uh, important for the reason because that is where all the indigenous people have been living and it was uh, discovered or explored around the 1690s by uh, European. Um, European explorers who came in this region around the 1690s and s uh, made settlements there and they began and so proper settlements uh, in this region Saskatchewan actually began uh, around 1770s. So, we are looking at the 17th and the 18th century as important uh, centuries when this kind of migration is taking place and uh, within this migration, uh, you know, in this exercise of migration, Europeans come and settle in these places. 
Now, um, the, when the Europeans, the whites, they come to uh, uh, this uh, part of the globe, uh, you, if you know something about uh, the United States history, then uh, you would also um, uh, recall that uh, a lot of Protestants had to flee uh, England uh, because of this kind of uh, kind of um, uh, extermination that was taking place of the Protestants at the time in England, and so they felt that they felt the need in the 17th century particularly in the 1620s or so the need to leave that place and build a new world for themselves a new brave world for themselves which would um, which they uh, also started calling new england in united states in the united states of america now similarly there were these uh, europeans also who came in partly because of exploration and partly because they wished to uh, also settle in the new region because they so what happens is that even in canada you have uh, people from England, the uh, you know England come in and settle in um, Canada, and you have people coming from Europe as well, the white uh, uh, you know uh, settlers who come and actually uh, the white Europeans who actually come and settle in Canada. So on the one hand, you have the English uh, settlements; on the other, you have the French settlements. They are the they are the major um, these these two are the major groups who come and settle in Canada. Now the difference, why we are drawing that difference, why we are not just calling them white uh, uh, settlers in Canada, is that their religions, uh, you know, they they have different religions by this time, because uh, the English people have been introduced to the Protestant ideas, and they have um, they they are they they are inculcating them, and it is their religion also partially, and you know, th to have an ideal world based on their religious practice that brings them to uh, Canada and also to the United States. Now this, uh, you know, this exercise makes them come and settle in uh, Canada. When they come and settle in Canada, what happens is they bring their, so they are Protestants who are English and they are also Catholics who have come from other European countries and uh, you know such as France and Spain, mostly France. These people also come and settle in uh, Canada. Now these two groups then religiously speaking, they are, uh, they follow uh, different paths uh, as far as approaching God is concerned. When they come to Canada then, they uh, marry the indigenous uh, women and that is what makes this kind of a mixed blood that I was talking about. That uh, these people, the Europeans, the white Europeans, they come to Canada, there there are the indigenous people. Uh, you know, people, who, the natives of the land in Canada, there these people have been living, there these are tribal communities, ethnic groups that are there and they marry then the women of that indigenous culture and those women, you know, there and there are different groups such as the Cree in this particular case, in Maria Campbell's case, her gra great grandmother is uh, is from, is has a Cree lineage. Her uh, maternal uh, grandmother ha is from, is French and yet again, again, a kind of a uh, mixed uh, uh, kind of blood uh, has the lineage of a mixed blood because the mother's fa family got and married into the uh, treaty Indians. So, you know there are many many subgroups within this culture, but largely speaking there is uh, what we are speaking of is that when the white settlers come to Canada, then they marry the women folk of the indigenous culture and then they settle there and make their living. Now, these people who marry uh, the indigenous women, they uh, you know become def different ethnic groups, what, what we refer to or what Maria Campbell has referred to as the half breeds. As against though that population of people of all white settlers who marry among themselves and then they build their own culture. So, there is on the one hand you have this kind of a mixed lineage, you have this kind of mixed marriages and on the other you have pure so to speak white settlers who have married uh, with their you know the with white women and have uh, you know have settled in the region and are continuing to live there. Now, as uh, centuries pass, we notice that there are lot of there is lot of conflict in the region because of the insecurities, particularly of the indigenous or the Aboriginal population. Now, Aboriginal is a word which we use for the indigenous population of uh, Canada. 
Now, so uh, you know this indigenous or aboriginal or the native population then or uh, the, the mixed blood people who have you know settled with the white settlers and have made a living there, have made families and have extended families then they have their own culture and the culture of the indigenous population obviously gels and you know comes in contact interacts with the white settlers culture. So, you know they somehow have a different kind they become a kind of in itself they become a kind of an ethnic group. Uh, the, and these people are referred to as the Métis or the Métis. If you is take the French uh, pronunciation, then it would be Métis. M-E-T-I-S is how it is spelled. But then uh, in England, in English, it is called Métis and in French, it is Métis. So, these people are also referred to as the Métis uh, community. Now, uh, and the, well, the, the half breeds, the, uh, you know, the mixed blood, uh, they are also derogatively called black Scots and other names are other such derogatory names are used uh, for them. But uh, coming back to the history of the region and to understand the culture and the population, uh, we have to uh, we have to remember that then 17th century onwards this kind of settlement took place. And 18th century you saw that things were taking shape and you know uh, uh, the settlers had made their colonies had begun to stay there and all that had happened. Now by the time you come to the 19th century uh, Canada faced a lot of problems both in you know within the country uh, within the country and from outside. From outside there was a pressure they thought the Canadian um, uh, people uh, as a whole they thought that uh, they, they were um, they, they felt there was a threat coming from the United States of America who was looking towards expansion and was going to perhaps uh, you know uh, take over. So, there were some people who came from United States and thought that they could control Canada and so they were looking towards a kind of an expansion and this Canada had to resist and to resist it it had to make its own boundaries strong and it had to appear as a kind of a unified nation. So, in the 1860s, uh, uh, this movement comes to the fore, uh, which is called the uh, movement towards building a kind of confederate, uh, confederation of Canada, where all provinces would be united under this category of United Provinces of Canada or the con they call them the confederates. Now, in this exercise, what was, so, you know, there were, there were uh, 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 these kind of uh, uh, organizations made, uh, government, the Canadian government made different uh, organizations would, would go and inspect different regions and bring them into the fold of the, of Canada. This was also because they wanted to define their own territory at this point in time. Now, because colonization was, uh, you know, uh, was was an active exercise in this region, you also had many other companies such as the Hudson Bay Company, which occupied land in Canada. Now, these companies which had stake, which occupied land, the first thing that the Canadian government did at that time in order to make, in order to have a, uh, in order to defend its territories was to buy land from such companies and uh, to send them packing, so that the land belonged belongs to the government. Now, this Rupert's land, this particular land which the Hudson Bay Company occupied, uh, this is the region that we are talking, this is also the region, this Hudson Bay Company with the land that it has is also the region where most of the indigenous population lives. Now, this is all, this is called the Rupert's land. So, this Rupert's land is bought by the Canadian government, the Hudson Bay Company sells, sells it off and goes out of the country. When that land is sold, when that land is transferred around 1869 uh, to the Canadian government, the Métis people who have been living there, who, uh, who have till now been living there and have had no sort of uh, formal entitlement to the land they have no they don't have any kind of land certificates that this land belongs to them they somehow feel the threat that the canadian government which is predominantly uh, that of the white protestants you see, meanwhile, in this uh, period, what has also happened is that, you see, conflicts are happening at many levels. So, uh, Canada is trying to uh, ward off the trouble from United States. It is also trying to appease the communities that are there within Canada. At the same time, uh, the Brit you know, the, uh, the, the, the groups that occupy, that have control over Canada, they are not just the British. So, they were the British and the French who had stakes, who had colonies, who had land, and they were always the British and the 
French were always fighting over land in that region. So, and in this exercise, so the conflict between the British and the French and they had many battles. Finally, what happened was that the British during the 19th century, they were able to push off the French and, uh, you know, win a large chunk of uh, the Canadian portion. So that the Canadian government essentially became, uh, you know, the white British Protestant kind of a uh, government. And it was this that you know the French were were being expelled from that uh, from from Canada increasingly and of course gradually not that it just happened on uh, a day but the British gained major uh, control and of areas in Canada. Now with that, when we say the British gained control, then we rem we have to remember then the, that the British British were actually white Protestants. And all these uh, Métis community that we are talking about, the half-breed community that we are talking about, since they had European settlers come in uh, and uh, marry indigenous people, then they, they also brought in their religion. And a lot of these Métis community, because they were French, they had one side of the family was French, because of that, their religion was also Catholic in many sense. So, they feared the white Protestant government because also because they were... Uh, one, because they were half-breeds, because they were of mixed lineage and two, because they had a different religion that was the Catholic religion. So, they were, uh, be, they were fighting at both levels and they felt this threat that they might not be, um, uh, you know, they might not get the entitlement to their lands and they may not be, um, they may not be able to control their lands or live in the place where they are living, they might be ousted by the uh, government. And it is this threat that, um, you know, creates a kind of tension in the region in 1869 and leads to what is uh, referred to as the Red River Rebellion of 1869. Now, the Red River uh, Rebellion was, um, you know, was uh, spearheaded by uh, Louis Riel, who is a famous figure among, particularly among the Métis people. And he tried to, what, so what happened was that uh, it, since, the, the, since the Canadian government got the transfer from Hudson Bay Company in 1869, it decided to, was, you know, make committees. And these group of people, uh, they would go, you know, they were all governors, lieutenant governors, etc. They would go to different regions, inspect the region and then come back with uh, reports. But uh, since the Métis people living in Saskatchewan, uh, which was particularly the area, uh, you know, um, uh, occupied by the uh, indigenous people, these people, uh, you know, feared that they were not, they will not be allowed to keep their land. They didn't let this uh, in investigation committee come in. They didn't let this group, this committee come into their region. They, in fact, uh, tried to block it at the frontier at the gate. And for this, you know, uh, Louis Riel actually uh, set up his provisional government in the region. He set up a provisional government and, uh, you know, and uh, this is what we're talking about is, you know, is, is this particularly, especially the northwestern region of uh, um, uh, of uh, Canada, and so he, uh, when he, um, uh, when he set up his provisional government, it is then that uh, the Canadian government had to, uh, you know, give way partially and acceded to some of the rights of the Métis people that they will not be. They were given some kind of uh, receipts of land, for, uh, you know, partially so that they could live in their place and yet be a part of the confederation. So this, in a way, uh, settled the situation for a while. But Louis, uh, Louis Riel became a kind of an important figure for the Métis people and he was a figure where they and they pinned their hopes to this figure of uh, the leader and you know it is in this situation that there is also a lot of migration and lot of uh, movement that is taking place. So you know M Maria Campbell in her half-breed actually starts her autobiography on a very historical note and all this background that I am giving actually then sets makes the uh, beginning uh, you know uh, fit in this pattern and maybe I could just read out to you the uh, very history of uh, the region that she talks about. Let me quote the very first paragraph of uh, her um, uh, autobiography and here she says and I quote, in the 1860s Saskatchewan was part of what was then called the Northwest Territories and was a land free of towns, barbed wire, fences and farmhouses. The half-breeds came here from Ontario and Manitoba to escape the preju prejudice and hate that comes with the opening of a new land. 
The fear of the half-breeds that their rights would not be respected by the Canadian government when it acquired the land from the Hudson Bay Company, along with the prejudice of the white Protestant settlers, led to the Red River Rebellion of 1869. Louis Riel established a provisional government at Fort Garry, Manitoba, but escaped to the United States in 1870 when troops arrived from eastern Canada. So with their leaders and their lands gone, the half-breeds half fled to the area south of Prince Albert, Saskatchewan and established the settlements of Duke Lake, Bacho. So you see, and she goes on. So do you see the note here that she's taken? It's a very historical note, a matter of fact note. She's not going into the details. She skims over, skips over many details, but gives you a kind of a skeletal view of the history of the region. So, you know, interestingly, it's a kind of history of the region. It's a kind of a personal history. It's, it's also a book on the community of uh, the Meiji's people. So, you know, these all these elements in a way make this text very, it's a mine of, uh, you know, it's in a way a mine of can, uh, Canadians, Canada's history, culture and, um, you know, life in a way. So, you know, which is why I picked up this text because I thought that this in a way will acquaint us not only with uh, how people live, uh, you know, and she's of course writing in the 20th century, Half Breed is published in 1973. And so, you know, it's obviously about the 20th century life in Canada, but you know, the kind of range that this uh, uh, autobiography has, she's trying to trace the origins of her, uh, you know, community as well, going back to the 17th century, 18th century and building a kind of thread from there, you know, and suggesting how we have come this far. And, you know, the references to important historical figures then, you know, in a way works into her uh, her own narrative as well. So, a narrative which may be fictionalized in some places, but overall it is an autobiography or a memoir. So, it is meant to include certain historical episodes also from life. So, you see the idea is that then at the time of this rebellion, what uh, I did not talk about before reading the quotation was that once uh, Louis Riel, they once they were able to win that uh, and you know take a, a, a fight for their rights and win that particular battle against the Canadian government. But in the next episode, in the second episode, when they stand up for their rights, you actually have Louis Riel uh, executed, and you know so it's uh, it's as if the movement reached its peak uh, during the Red River Rebellion, and later on it also sees its decline. And when its leaders are dead, when its leaders are either thrown in prisons or they are, uh, you know, executed, it is then that the community feels completely helpless and it is pushed in its, um, pushed in uh, the zones of poverty and, uh, you know, where there, and poverty and frustration of the people and also a sense of helplessness. They feel that the Canadian government is no more willing to look after their interests and has turned indifferent towards them and they are supposed to live out their lives in the ghettos that they occupy in the region. Now, uh, you know, talking about the region that these, uh, uh, the Métis community actually uh, uh, occupy, they are, um, uh, you know, they, these are referred to as the uh, Canadian uh, prairies and these are grassland areas which they occupy. So, particularly when we are looking at these uh, three um, uh, you know, regions that we are talking about. We are talking about Ontario and we are talking about Saskatchewan and we are also uh, talking about um, uh, Manitoba. So, these three regions actually are a part of the Canadian prairies and these are the grassland, grassland areas where a lot of which is close to the forest where there, is, there are a lot of uh, where the hunting can be, hunting can take place. Uh, when we return in the next part of the lecture, I will actually talk about the culture of this community because uh, Campbell um, also talks about, uh, you know, how the community has been surviving, what is their uh, source of livelihood, how, how they live out their lives, how they sustain their themselves. So, they are close to the forest areas, they are close to the grasslands, which also means they are also away from, uh, uh, you know, the kind of the center or the hubs and they are also pushed towards these territories. If you notice here in the quotation that I read, 
uh, Maria Campbell says that uh, when the leaders were gone, the half-breeds fled to the area south of Prince Albert. So, they, they were pushed southwards in fact and they, they, they had to occupy what is called the marginal places and so they uh, seem to occupy the peripheries and uh, you know seem to be pushed away from the centre in that sense you know and that also makes them uh, minority communities that also makes them uh, you know communities that have been marginalised. So, this is the larger view that I wished you to have about the history of the region and how uh, the Métis community is fa formed and what are the struggles etc. that you see that they have made on the way. I mean I would like to invite um, at this point uh, Dr. Anand Prakash's view if he has any on this history of the region that is being built. Uh, Actually <coughs> very rightly you have explained the history of this place and it is a very complex history. It is full of tensions, you say, full of variety, and it explains, you know, the kind of uh, modifications that the writer will make while talking about it. So I think it's very useful. And uh, secondly, that you know, it's a tension-ridden thing, and the tension is uh, social, tension is cultural, religious, and uh, it's about economy. Yes. Because there are people who are investing money, there are people who are buying land, and there are people who are controlling the entire area under their own influence. So, all these things are very interesting, very significant and uh, they are I think uh, true matter for uh, literature. Mm. Uh, to, to and you know conflict out. is not just limited to one kind of conflict, you know mm. there are so many levels at which conflicts are taking place yes. and so many mm. sub communities. Mm -hmm. It is not like there is one community, one community is pitched against the another, you know the, there are there are mixed communities, even mixed communities are of different kinds, you know there are the, if the, there are the Indians, there are the uh, French Métis, there are the English mm. Métis, the Anglo Métis. Are they fighting for their identity also? Yes, they are and of course. Different communities. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. they are fighting for their identity, mm -hmm. and uh, identity, in fact, becomes an important issue in uh, most of the Aboriginal literature uh, because that—that's the idea that they are trying to preserve their identity. So Canada becomes different from Europe then. Yes, uh, majorly because it has it is multi ethnic mm -hmm. in many ways, which mm -hmm. uh, Europe is not in that sense. You know, because it has subgroups of uh, different even within the indigenous population. If you see, and uh, you know, there are uh, even when you're talking about three uh, settlements, then there are the uh, the First Nations. There is there are the there is the Métis community, but there is also the Inuits, and these are all different subgroups that we are talking about. Different isn't ethnic groups. Isn't there something positive? You know that uh, people have accepted out outsiders and they have developed this kind of half breeds half mm -hmm. breeds are the canadians right and uh, these this is uh, this has not happened in many other parts of the world and half breed is a derogatory word which people don't use anymore and therefore they use words like metis or inuits etc mm -hmm. but uh, you know maria campbell uh, constantly refers to her community as half breeds mm -hmm. you know as if uh, because it is derogatory for outsiders but for her you know it's a reality and also something that she accepts on the way and it's a kind of acceptance right, right. it's the kind of people getting together even though the term is wrong, the term mm. is uh, that will uh, not, not very judicious, but this is what uh, Canada is. Right. Canada, Canada is, is, a, is a mixture, is a combination. Right, right. Mm. So, mixed blood, yes, and of mixed origins of uh, um, and, and mixed ties, mm. you know, so the French, uh, French, the French indigenous, the Anglo indigenous, the, um, uh, the First Nations and those who have been living there and th the white settlers as well, all those different groups uh, exist in this particular region. I think that is very important, Dr. Reza Bajaj, uh, uh, at the end of the lecture, uh, I, I say this, that, you know, this is a very good background for uh, the creative writing that is going to happen there and uh, we will have more about uh, writing, we will have more about you know the writer expressing one's own experiences and experiences that uh, you know uh, combined with uh, the experiences of others. So that uh, belongs to the second part of the lecture and uh, please wait till then, thank you and then we come back to, to, to it again in the second part.
Welcome back viewers to the second part of the lecture. Uh, in the first part, Dr. Richa Bajaj talked about the historical cultural background of the writing that happened in the 20th century and in the second part, she will take up an extensive discussion of the book Half Breed which she has called a uh, memoir and also an autobiography. So, let us get back and Dr. Jabajad, please begin your second part. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anubrakash. Uh, so, uh, we, was, we were discussing the historical background of uh, uh, Maria Campbell's community, the Métis community as I referred to it and uh, you know how it has, how it came into origins, how, how the cultures were formed, how the place, how the geography was formed of Canada. So, if you see uh, uh, the Canada's uh, geography as I mentioned these three regions, uh, Saskatchewan, and Ontario and Manitoba, then you will see that you know they are all uh, from from the eastern sides the, um, uh, the Métis people have come towards Saskatchewan from Ontario. So, Ontario is to uh, you know on the eastern side of Canada, Canada and how uh, you know they travel and they keep shifting and they keep moving coming to a kind of a centered place which is Saskatchewan and you know as um, the protagonist uh, Maria in the uh, um, in the book you know keeps traveling she goes to Vancouver etc. So, you know there is a kind of a movement which goes across Canada. So, in a way it is also covering you know think of the range of this book which is covering uh, a centered centuries in the sense uh, beginning uh, from 17th century onwards talking about how settlements took place to talking even in the in terms of geography talking about the place and you know the shift uh, different shifts and different and migration that takes place within Canada as well. So, you see that is the kind of range that I was talking about both in terms of time historically speaking and in terms of space uh, geographically speaking. So, that is something which needs which we need to uh, you know uh, uh, keep in mind while we are um, uh, looking at Campbell's uh, work. Now, just a kind of a let me just tell you you know uh, Maria Campbell is actually she was born in 1940 and uh, you know uh, so and her first, you know she wrote Half Breed in 1973 and she has also written some children's uh, you know books which were meant to uh, as kind of a. Uh, you know they were meant to be uh, they were meant to create awareness among children of the Medes people as well. So, you know the children books that the three children books that she has written the uh, you know the first is titled people of the buffalo which came out in 1975. The second one is the little badger and the fire spirit which came out in 1977 and reels people in 1978. She has also penned a play which is a uh, flight and also later on she made some films etc which uh, were also telecasted on BBC and other networks. So, you see the idea is that she is a multifaceted um, uh, personality and that she has also tried to write in the different genres and you know here when she writes half breed she says uh, you know in the in the in the introduction to the uh, work she says you know I, I, if I had not been angry enough I would not have been able to write it you know. So, it is anger in, and it is this kind of uh, fierce anger that has made her write this work. So, you know suggesting that uh, that this is both a memoir and an autobiography in that sense. Uh, you know, if one had to make a kind of a different talk about the difference between memoir and our autobiography, then uh, what would you say? Uh, how is a memoir different from an autobiography? And actually, I'd like An Dr. An Prakash to uh, tell us the difference between an autobiography and a memoir, according to him. Well, memoir, I think, um, uh, is the impressions that you gather from different incidents and events in your life, in one's life. And uh, autobiography is, uh, I think, more uh, narratable, more uh, articulate, more integrated impact, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there are less of impressions mm -hmm. in, in autobiography. Mm -hmm. So I'm giving you a working difference between, between the yeah. two terms. No, of course I have my own difference, but I thought yes. that this will uh, yeah. add to that thing. So you know, in a memoir, there are there are all memoirs not centered on the person. An autobiography, as the title, as the term suggests, is a biography of the person. So you know, the centered subject is the central subject the protagonist while in a memoir the characters who form a part of that milieu becomes they become important. So, while a memoir could be of a particular region of a place of a culture of a community an autobiography returns keeps returning to oneself you know. So, so shall I call it's a memoir narration. a kind of uh, coexistence of different pictures 
and yes. the, 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 that is memoirs yes and a biography of the community mm -hmm. you know where mm -hmm. other people other characters also yes. exist yes. and the central consciousness is not overpowering mm -hmm. the you know the the narrative that is going on so you know that is something that and you know there are in some cases this work is considered and a memoir or people call it autobiography while they obviously the idea is that they are this is taken from life it is true and it's factual and it is based on the person's life but you know as people who are dealing with uh, subjects but of in literature autobiography, there is a kind mm. of uh, line of development there is a kind right. of line of evolution right. which may not be the case in in, in, in a, a memoir, memoir. Mm -hmm. right so you know in the beginning so what uh, a kind of a working uh, uh, you know explanation of what is this book a memoir or an autobiography because it's uh, interchangeably used but mm. uh, I thought we should become conscious of using these words I Who think the protagonist the here in, yes, in the book that's what I'm, I'm coming to so mm. in the beginning the protagonist is not the this uh, you know young girl who's uh, nine years old and then 12 years old or 14 years old you know at that stage in her life she's seen as an observer and mm -hmm. so in this stage of an observer she has many characters whether it is this grandmother or that uh, aunt whose life also she's explaining on the way and therefore these characters become equally important so in the first part of her life in the formative years when the narrator is an observer in this stage the book appears more of a memoir which has different episodes different stories of people are narrated simultaneously that the writer is aware of but increasingly as you move towards the latter part of the text you realize that the central consciousness as the woman has grown into an adult woman and is dealing with issues and this is post her marriage you know that she when she leaves her home place and when or uh, not just post her marriage I think it would be post when she leaves when she loses a mother and takes on the responsibility of the household it is at this stage that you know she appears to be a kind of a person who's reflecting thinking about her life also taking decisions based on what is good for the family and at is it is at this stage that you realize this uh, text has turned in the direction of autobiography which means where the central character's consciousness in a way governs the action of the book can you call it a novel also yes in yeah i also you can mm. call it a novel because in the sense that you know if you notice at some places uh, you know what is uh, you, you are told that this the names of the places and people have been changed in some cases and mm. you know there will be a footnote you will mm. notice in the book that you know it, it says that the names of places or people may have been changed now the moment you change something in the text when you change the place then you have already entered in the imaginative uh, arena and you have added and you, you also then become free the moment you don't have to stick to the place or the person then you don't feel a responsibility or a sense of limitedness to talk about only about the region you become free instantly and you start talking and adding details to that imaginative space or that person because the you, mean fiction, you, you bring in fiction then fiction yes. is a kind of lie a significant lie that is there in literature right. That, right. That, that's what makes it a novel yeah and it, mm. there's a kind of imaginative freedom that instantly mm. you uh, gain the moment you uh, change the names of people and subjects you can also then you become more free to modify their sensibility etc even as largely it is uh, autobiographical that's a good phrase imaginative freedom yes the that, that is what the uh, narration uh, at, at some point of time al allows you sanctions to you right right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it gets a kind of uh, that kind of a space for the mm -hmm. writer to add details which may not be uh, true to mm -hmm. life you mm -hmm. know and so in that realm uh, even as it is largely autobiographical there are certain elements which you would feel uh, have been added to the and you can text. squeeze time sequence right you, you can sometimes you know talk of, of a year in, 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 in 10 pages and another week in 20 pages that that kind which, of which uh, stylistically speaking which she is also doing even when she calls it a historical work mm. you see when she is talking in the beginning the very first page is about uh, talks about 1869 etc and the actual movement of her life uh, is takes place in around the 1940s or so when mm. she is born mm. so she is born in 1940 and that's when she then she traces her life etc till 1973 you know so movement back and forth makes it right. a kind of fiction makes it a kind of fiction so even when she is using historical uh, mm. moments in history she is not uh, trying to go linear or chronological about it she is going back and forth as you can as you go back back and forth while you're talking about your story of your life then uh, you don't limit yourself the whole idea 
uh, one thing is that you live out this life the second thing is when you start narrating your life then you have even when you are talking about your life you have fictionalized you have added and modified it because you are going are to you some uh, do you have some uh, imaginary circumstances also Imagine in, completely in the in in this book. No, I don't think so. They, I mean, at least that's uh, we don't know in person. We don't mm. know the writer. Mm. But as far as instances are concerned, uh, these all have happened to her. So when she refers to her marriage, she refers to substance abuse that she goes through, depression, even uh, attempts of suicide at times. All these have actually happened in the life of the person, you know. And uh, it, that's that's so it is recounted as something that she has gone through in life. So in your opinion, essentially, this, this is an autobiography. Yes. Essentially. Well, uh, that's what I was trying to, um, you know, free the word autobiography from mm. its conventional uh, definition. Mm. Mm -hmm. That it autobiography doesn't mean that it is only true and nothing of fiction could be added. Mm -hmm. When the writer narrates one's life, then one may add certain things in the process of writing and narrating it to understand oneself. To self. understand or to throw light on. Mm. So why? So and the writer is also giving meaning to stories and instances that took place in her life. Mm. And the very act of giving meaning to something means that. you have uh, imposed your pattern on it which uh, in, in life it's too free and it's uh, too amorphous it must be a very moving account what do you say from from your personal reading of the book yes it it is a it is about the resilience of this character it's about the resilience of this woman mm. and you know in this uh, uh, the character maria's character she draws a lot from her uh, great grandmother whom she calls chicham in the Uh, autobiography mm -hmm. now chicham is that figure who has who has sustained maria in fact who has helped her go through these different episodes in life mm -hmm. and you know she it's a it's a story of a woman who's gone through so much and has still emerged out of it and uh, with a fighting spirit and you know again at, at the whole act of writing as she says is because she was angry and it is anger that made her write this book you know so the idea that she has gone through a lot and yet feels the anger and not helplessness towards life why is she angry she is angry because of the kind of uh, oppressive uh, kind of poverty that uh, her community has gone through and the kind of frustrations that they've gone through the way uh, why 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 should uh, let me just speak uh, tell you directly from what she says so she says that uh, and, and this is in the introduction to her work uh, to the autobiography she says um, uh, i write this for you for all of you to tell you what it is like to be a half breed woman in our country mm -hmm. i want to tell you about the joys and sorrows the oppressing poverty the frustrations and the dreams there's not a single positive word here yes no there are dreams there are joys Okay, if you find it okay, yes okay. and even dreams are mm. there mm. so it's not to say that she's entirely you see i and and that is natural i think that um, it, it's a are, realistic are the dreams or nightmares these are she calls them dreams mm. she talks about the frustrations and the dreams you mm. see frustrations happen when you have dreams mm. i mean if you don't have dreams then you won't be frustrated that they are they've come to not that's, that's a good so, insight yes so uh, the mm. the people have uh, hopes people have dreams and when they crash it is then that frustrations uh, comes in mm. and anger also comes in then mm. because you dream some of something else you hope for something else but it makes you angry i mean if you thought that this was like this is what life is going to be for the half breed community in canada and this is how they've lived so uh, the narrator's mother and uh, never questioned the surroundings the narrator's mother said that well you know let's not go into politics let's not fight let's not have hold meetings because it destroys people we should try to live our life to the best mm -hmm. and please god so you know that kind of narrative does it appeal to the narrator who 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 sees the unjust circumstances around her and there is prejudice and the cruelty uh which ha happens at so many layers when she talks about her school life and she she sees that you know uh, she was she, she mentions about a teacher who was on the surface a very well behaved teacher but she said that you know there was a cruelty to about her towards the half breed community who came to study in that school and you know she would be nice to uh the white white people but she would be cruel towards the half breeds so you know cruelty coming from different levels and the kind of thing she faces in school you know again because it is an autobiography and it has this evolution of self in place then she also talks about the kind of prejudices and the kind of um, inferiority complex that she had when she went to school and when she said that lunch time was the worst time because that's when we opened our tiffins and we saw what the whites were getting and what we were getting at home 
Does she talk like a rebel or like a sufferer? No, no, both. Mm -hmm. So she suffers, but she rebels. Mm -hmm. She's, uh, you know, so that is the kind of suffering, and there is an intense suffering that she goes through, mm -hmm. and but she rebels every time. You know, so when the moment you think she's in the at, at the point of breakdown. And she has a nervous breakdown. She doesn't remember. She says, well, I didn't know the next moment I saw the doctor and the doctor told me that I had taken many pills and I had a nervous breakdown. But so, you know, the moment you see that she's on the point of a tragedy, she emerges from there. The moment you feel that she has lost everything and that's where, uh, you know, she's going to lose herself, she regains and comes back. And that's, that is what contributes to her resilience. I would call this, it a uh, statement of courage. What would you call it? Yes, it is obviously a statement of courage to rise from the ashes, so to speak. And, mm. you know, she reaches such and, you know, the uh, the detailing, the narrative is very engaging because, you know, it, it it's 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 um, the st it's it's in a very much enough. It goes in the flow. It's mm. not a proper English. And the English also you will note is not one which w what that you would associate as academic writer or an academic English where one is conscious of images, one is conscious of metaphors or beautiful language etc. She just goes with the flow and she tells a story as if her grandmother were telling a story. Not Queen's English. No, not at all. And she in fact she, it's a narrator, it's it's as if she would she was actually speaking to you. Mm. It is as if somebody is narrating an event or the one's life as you would to a person speaking. So it has that kind of spontaneous, um, uh, you know, it has spontaneity in that sense that it maintains it. And she talks to the reader generally, uh, skipping sometimes even uh, some uh, uh, words, articles. You know, she wouldn't, it's at some places you would see the, an article missing and she wouldn't bother. And, you know, you would see it at a couple of places and then you'd see that that's a part of her narrative scheme to not bother about words per se or correct English usage also. And that in a way tells a, a lot about the folklorish life and the folktaleish stories that they have heard in their community. Just one instance where of community life uh, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, of how they lived there, how they spent their days, how they lived their lives, what was the community like. And I quote, she says in one instance, our parents spent a great deal of time with us and not just our parents, but other parents in our settlement. They taught us to dance and to make music on the guitars and fiddles. They played card with cards with us. They would take us on long walks and teach us how to use the different herbs, roots and barks. We were taught to weave baskets with the red willow. And while we did these things, while we did these things together, we were told stories of our people, who, who they were, where they came from, what they had done. Many were legends handed down from father to son. Many of them had a lesson, but mostly they were fun stories about funny people. You know, so that's the kind of culture that we are looking at. We are looking at stories of people and how they spend their time and their living. Would you call her a pure soul uh, with whom you will empathize completely? I don't know what a pure soul means really. Pure soul means that, that uh, everything that she says is acceptable and because it is sensitive. Yes, yeah, sensitive, yes. She has felt, uh, you know, the point is that she has felt her own life and mm. the lives of people she has lived with very intensely. And so she, as and much she as she has lived, yes, she she, of course, of course she wins our confidence because you see she's very, she's able to sensitively portray mm. uh, the characters around her. Mm. And it's not that she doesn't have anger or rebellion in, uh, or s biases or prejudices and, but, and she's angry. If I, if I could just quote another instance from the uh, text and she's showing her anger towards the church community and, and, and toward, and this is her attitude towards religion that she maintains. Uh, you know, and let me just quote this one piece again. Eventually, our people were able to build a church and two, nurse, two nuns came to keep house for the priest. We were all baptized and I had to go to catechism. What a drag that was. The nuns would never answer our questions and all we did was pray and pray until our knees were sore. The churchyard, which was the graveyard uh, as well, was just down the hill from our house and it had the most ludicrous strawberries in the countries. So, and however, we weren't allowed to pick them. The berries, said the father, belonged to the church and if we took them, it would be stealing from God. This made us very angry. 
unquote. Mm. So you see this kind of a, a girl's and, and, and opinion. humor also. Yes, and there is humor mm. when she says strawberries were ludicrous mm -hmm. there, yes. or when she says that ch churchyard was a graveyard. Mm. You know, so in a way. She's showing her as a growing up, and this is her formative years. She's ten years old or so when she's in this stage, and she's going through this exercise. So there's a kind of inherent or innate rebellion that is there in her, because you know, at one moment um, she also says that I don't know how my mother doesn't see that uh, the father fleeces us and is cruel to us, and this whole system is against us. And uh, you know, so she she also makes that narrative uh, pertinent for us to. To me, uh, she becomes voice of an angry young woman in the modern world hmm. who, who is critical of right. society, critical of religion, critical right. of all that goes against humanity. Yes, that is true. And you know, here again in another quote, she again uh, puts across her point. She says, our people talked against the government, their white neighbor and each other, but never against the church or the priest, regardless of how bad they were. No one, that is, except Chichim, who hated them with a vengeance. So Chichim is her confidant, in fact, in the text, and she takes on her spirit from uh, Chichim, who is uh, who's this uh, this this great grandmother who refuses to die. In in fact, you know, she's 96 while the uh, the uh, narrator is just growing up, is eight or ten years old, and and you know, she takes a lot from Chichim, this kind of hatred for things that, and this kind of courage, and also this kind of pride in one's own community and you know and trying to uh, fight for one's rights so you see this is something that she's taken from Chicham and you know Chicham then is a very important figure in this particular book in fact the two, two characters become one right one is, one is young the other is senior but then the and young would senior, become senior she's a great grandmother great grandmother hmm. and uh, that way she is moving towards that kind of great Right. That the great, great grandmother yeah. uh, encompasses. And you know, yeah. the idea of human dignity then mm -hmm. is becomes important for both as goals in life. So, whether when, wherever your human dignity is compromised, whether it is in the church or uh, among the white, uh, with the white governments, it is there that they uh, put their foot down and fight for it. You know, and, and anger being an important characteristic. So her mother is not never angry, you know, and, and accepts everything as uh, and is submissive. And it is that that angers her more. You know, so it's it's anger as a positive value that she has learned to inculcate. Hatred as a positive value that she has learned to inculcate uh, and uh, and use it against uh, Isn't institutions. Isn't it interesting that the, the the woman is able to identify it with, with with the great grandmother and not with the mother? Yes, that that's yeah. true. Yeah. And yeah. she sees that her mother is to in, is in the clutches of tradition and is in the clutches of uh, you know that kind of uh, patriarchy as also um, uh, the whole social system that her uh, grand great grandmother is not. Mm -hmm. So you know, and it has also to do with the great grandmother being a Cree. She's an she is that indigenous woman who uh, who oh, married really. the great grandfather. Mm -hmm. So she's from the she is a woman of the earth and where they live. You know, so sh she has this kind of um, she she displays in her character this kind of right and this claim to the place where she stays. Mm -hmm. So which the other characters because of mixed heritage and lineage because her mother is uh, come from another community of the French uh, settlers and you know her mother was also well to do in that sense but then came to uh, live in so at, the, so at the state so of so poverty. So the contamination. Later that came from the middle generations right. that is missing in the case of great grandmother yes who's a who's a cree who's a who's a complete cree and therefore the identity of the cree community that mm -hmm. uh, you know that the writer actually associates more with mm -hmm. so the whole term of uh, the half breed you know she's at one moment she says oh i will not marry because i don't want to breed more half breeds mm -hmm. around you mm -hmm. know there is a kind of also a rebellion against that kind of an outlook that you know they are all half breeds because she doesn't look at herself as a half breed she in fact looks at herself as the a Cree you know a person of who's born uh, of this land who is rooted in the country uh, rooted in the country and the place so you know she, and and uh, the constant looking down upon them by you know etc is something that comes in uh, later so it's a kind of resistance against prejudice also yes very much um, and um, which is there in the state structures, which hmm. is there in the cultural structures, that prejudice. Right. So she in a way is fighting against those structures. Right, that is true. She's fighting against these structures and you know, I was just thinking that if I could find uh, a, you know, a place where she, she actually talks about how her own family has been brought to this miserable state of poverty and how her, the, that generation became crippled uh, and this is her word that she uses. Um, 
I will just quote this uh, because we are talking about how she is different from her father's mother's generation and associates more with the generation of her great grandmother. And so when she says here, so began a miserable life of poverty which held no hope for the future. That generation of my people was completely beaten. Their fathers had failed during the rebellion to make a dream come true. They failed as farmers. Now there was nothing left. Their way of life was part of Canada's past and they saw no place, uh, you know, for themselves. Now the point, uh, unquote. Now the point is that, you know, it is because of those failed fights that they have put on that it has seeped into the generations that have come in. And later on she says that, I quote, you sometimes see that generation today, the crippled, bent old grandfathers and grandmothers on town and city skid rows, you find them in the bush waiting to die. So you see, unquote. So you see this kind of this that generation of grandmothers and uh, etc. who are waiting to die and who feel crippled in the circumstance because they have not fought back because a failed revolution has in a way seeped in the families and in the culture itself. And here she is taking up arms against that kind of a generation and you know establishing the uh, you know her own way of life. And the life in Canada in the 1970s. Hmm. that you think is a different kind of a life you see there are lot there is lot of suffering still and here you know that the process as she talks about her growing up and so this was of course the uh, period of her growing up etc but when she comes into life and when she's taken uh, center stage then uh, you know these people who were called the road allowance people you know these uh, the half breeds were also called road allowance people because they never had any place on they occupied no land so she actually moves out of the place and when she goes mm. to the industry that's when you know she's met with new kind of life she please, turns to please use three sentences to sum up the novel okay. or, the, or, the, or the autobiography right you see the it's uh, if i have to say then it is a uh, it's a novel that it's a it's an autobiography that charts that the history of the region along with the present which has also become more industrialized and uh, has uh, you know uh, has brought in the market in it so she is able to cover the entire 20th century of uh, canadian life and go beyond into 19th 18th century so that's the first point from the point of view so she is giving a view of the community life the geographical view of the community the historical view of the community those are aspects that come into her autobiography and lastly she talks about the identity of the metis community well, friends, we have uh, reached the conclusion of the lecture, and uh, which is uh, showing, you know, a kind of critical attitude that is there in the book against the structures that, you know, worked around the uh, character, the, the, the central consciousness, as Dr. Richard Bajaj has called it. I, I hope you enjoyed the lecture, and you can discuss it, think with your friends, and more than that, uh, take this novel and read it. That that will be a very good way of, you know, appreciating the, the sense of anger that the writer you know has expressed thank you and thank you dr bajaj thank you